Okay, uh, so I guess let's just wait for 20, 30 seconds before everybody joins and then we are going to start. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another uh, episode of the learning series by Pakistani Women in Computing, Lahore Chapter. Thank you for joining in. So, for this episode, GDG Lahore and GDG Pakistan have also collaborated with us on this event. So, welcome aboard. Before we get started, I want to talk about the learning series for the people who are joining in for the very first time. Learning series was started by PWIC Lahore towards the end of 2020 to fill in the gap which COVID-19 created in terms of learning opportunities. The main goal of the learning series is to enable networking with the industry and uh, academia mentors while sitting at home. The sessions consist of both technical and non-technical sessions in various fields. Currently, in the first phase, we are doing sessions in the area of data science and machine learning. All the sessions are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel as well, so make sure you check it out. So we have had two sessions uh, until now, so if you can search on YouTube, go to PWIC, you will be able to find all the recorded sessions over there as well. So if you're interested, uh, do make sure to check the channel out. Today's session is the third episode in the learning series. And in this quick introductory session, we'll walk uh, all of you through the analogies to learn the core concepts behind machine learning and why it works so well. Our speaker for today is Ramsha Siddiqui. Uh, Ramsha Siddiqui works as a data scientist in NLP, working in the domain of conversational AI and dialogue systems at I2C. She is the Women Technicals Ambassador, Scholar, and Lead at Women Developers Group uh, as well. So thank you, Ramsha, for joining in today as the speaker. Uh, over to you. You can tell the audience about the motivation and importance behind preparing this session. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ramsha. She's already introduced me. Um, so this session is an introductory course for um, anyone who's trying to get into machine learning. So whether you're a web developer or an Android developer or maybe just a student in your junior year, um, I think this session might be good for you to just get an overview of the different terms that are very commonly used in machine learning, but um, are usually explained with mathematical formulas and code. And so it's it's very rare or you would have to find, look for videos where um, things are explained at a more um, like student level where you can understand them, but still not uh, I mean, you can you can still understand them, but like you don't have to implement them from scratch. So um, yeah, it's it's my take on um, how machine learning really resembles human learning, and um, it 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 helped me um, overall understand machine learning a bit a bit better. And so I thought, um, yeah, I should I should do a session on it and um, share it with um, an audience. So um, should I start now? Tuba? I think I, sh I should. All right, so the name of the session is machine learning and um, uh, it's like a walk through school exams. Um, my name is Ramsha Siddiqui and um, she's already introduced me a bit, but I'll just go over this again quickly. Um, I'm an associate data scientist in NLP at I2C Incorporated Lahore. I work in the domain of conversational AI and dialogue systems. Um, I'm the lead at Google Developers Group Lahore and I'm also a member or rather ambassador of uh, Google Women Tech Makers. Last year, I graduated from Women Developers Academy and um, I'm, a, I'm a graduate from Fast Nuses Lahore back in 2019. And in 2018, I was a Global U grad alumnus from UIW. So um, let's get on with the session. 
Um, I think the first question that you may want to ask is that a lot of people think uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence are correlated. So what is machine learning specifically? Well, machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence that um, allows machines to learn and improve from experience, their experience being um, their own selves or data um, without being explicitly programmed to do so like you would do in a general rule-based system. And um, it's, it's been known to solve almost almost um, any, any problem in the world. And uh, people are actually, uh, they actually are using it <laughs> to solve every problem in the world. Um, and to get, um, get like um, an understanding of how machines learn, um, what my take on this is that we should first look into how humans um, learn of any specific um, concept or knowledge. Um, so, yeah, the typical life of a student starts with um, you enrolling in a course or picking up a book or maybe watching in a YouTube video. Um, you generally need the help of a tutor or a teacher to, you know, get those early on concepts. And, um, yeah, that's this is a stage of where you're just gathering um, theoretical knowledge um, about the subject. Uh, the second step is where you extract concepts. So um, just reading a book will not, will probably not help you a lot or just watching a video will probably not help you a lot unless you deduce your own concepts um, from, from that information. So usually what I do is that I create like flow diagrams or make notes in my diary, do, do something that really helps me um, understand and um, analyze that information that's coming to me from these sources um, in my own way. And so that's the st stage I'm calling you that where you extract your concepts. Um, the third stage is where you practice those concepts, right? So um, let's say you were in a math class, you would um, implement those um, equations that you, you're trying to solve with maybe some um, random examples. Or um, if you're a programmer, you will try to run an algorithm or maybe even write an algorithm or debug it yourself. Um, or, or you might solve like a practice quiz or something like that, that really just helps you understand the concepts that you've just learned and um, kind of revise them in, in, in your head. Um, and then finally, um, what every student has to go through <laughs> in order to be sure that he's completely learned a concept is that he'd, he'd have to sit through tests, right? Um, those tests could be like in-person tests where you have to write it on a paper or maybe a theoretical test where uh, you just have to answer MCQs or write an essay. Um, at the end of the test, you will have some grader or examiner that will grade you based on your output or your um, answers. Um, and then you can you can compare your performance um, to others or generally on a subject and um, see where you stand. And then after that, you would either, you know, you'd go to um, either, you, you know, you start gathering your knowledge again, or maybe you'll um, strengthen your concepts or maybe practice some more. It's not really a one, two, three, four. You can, you can kind of pretty much, I mean, these days you could just gather the knowledge and directly sit for a test. And for some people that works as well. Um, so just to give you an example, a real life example of um, someone learning something, let's say you're, you're new to chess and you're trying to learn chess. Well, step one would be to learn what the pieces are. You know, maybe, I think the first step would be might, might be downloading the application or buying the chessboard <laughs> or, or getting it from somewhere but then eventually you learn what the pieces represent and what how each of them moves um the second step would be to understand what a movement of a chess piece can um how the movement of a chess piece can influence the movement of other chess pieces what are the number of moves that are left once you you know once you move those certain pieces around what's it like to play as a you know for with, with black um yeah with black players versus white players um, yeah, so uh, this would be a stage where you'd be understanding how chess works and then memorizing it. Maybe I think it's it's more of a memory game. I don't really know chess, so <laughs> this is not a very personal example. Um, the third step would be to probably practice tests. So um, you might be playing speed chess with your colleagues or your friends or your family, where um, you'd be working out those algorithms in your own head um, in, in real time with, with a person and seeing whether you're losing or you're winning. And then finally, you, you might be able to compete in actual competitions and um, see where you stand with those, um, you know, with um, chess holders or, yeah, actual um, important people in chess. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so this leads us to now moving on to how machines learn. And so just how there were four steps in human learning, I'm going to show you that there are the same four steps um, involved in, in, in machine learning as well. So the first step would be to gather your knowledge or to gather training data. And training data is the same sort of form of knowledge that you would give to a human in order to understand a problem. So it has to be a set of data points that maybe is required for image classification, maybe it's required to extract something from an audio, maybe something from a text, you know, and any problem that you have, you would need those um, data annotators or data curators to, um, yeah, just create some of those training data for you and um, that you can feed into your machine learning algorithm that will eventually solve your problem. Okay, so just like we, you would extract concepts from um, whatever uh, raw information you were fed earlier, machines also require data to be pre-processed or you know, just refined in a manner that um, useful features can be extracted from it. And um, you know, the results or the performance of the model can be improved. So for example, an image might need to be um, broken down into um, its numerical components based on um, pixel int intensity or um, it may, maybe the color definition. Um, in the same way, text words might be split into different tokens where um, each word is represented as a token ID or um, as an embedded representation of um, what the word represents, right? Um, so a question you might ask me here is like, why is data processing important? Um, so there's a term in machine learning that people use called garbage in and garbage out. Um, that is used when, you know, if you feed in garbage or raw data to your machine learning system, you're bound to produce a garbage machine learning output or machine learning algorithm. Um, whereas if you pre-process your data into some quality format, um, you're bound to good results uh, with your machine learning algorithm as well. So I've mentioned the machine learning algorithm quite a few times. Um, it's, it's the term that's specifically used for that is called model. And uh, you, you might have already heard people saying, you know, the word model a few times associated with machine learning or artificial intelligence. Um, so let's, um, let's define that. A uh, machine learning model is an algorithm or a mathematical derivation that contains variables that can be derived or learned from your training data. Um, so um, let's say that if we compare a model with um, a human brain, um, all human brains have this um, huge capacity to learn and um, it's, it's really your choice on exactly what you're learning. <laughs> you might read novels or um, have song lyrics up in there or maybe movies. Um, but um, ultimately, yeah, all of that machine memory is kind of like having those um, random variables that you can fill out with um, almost anything, right? So yeah, yeah, machine learning models are also kind of like that. Um, if you have a particular task that you want to train on or that you want to solve, what you would do is um, initialize a machine learning model with that number of variables or an abstract number of variables that you assume will be good um, for learning that problem. And um, yeah, that algorithm would automatically learn the values of those variables based on your input data. Um, after the model is trained, the values of those variables are saved so that you can use them for predictions later. So here I've given like a, a the algorithm, uh, sorry, a, our mathematical formula, but it's not specifically the mathematical formula that's used in machine learning. It's just to give you an idea that if you're trying to learn X, we would need the values of B, A, and C, and these values are probably coming in from our data. So um, the third step of um, after you've gathered your knowledge and you've processed your data, you've extracted useful features from it, is to select your model. Um, selecting the right kind of model for your machine learning problem is also important because um, feature learning or uh, data understanding is an internal process for machines. And um, certain types of algorithms are more well suited for you know, certain types of problems. Um, and we're going to look into the two broadest types of models or machine learning problems that um, commonly exist or the, these are the ones that people usually have to deal with.
Um, the first one is called supervised learning. Um, this is when the expected outputs of your model, they're defined by your data annotators. So it's not just raw text or you know raw input variables that you're just um, not sure of what, what, what to do with. There's an actual um, task that you're trying to solve and you have an actual data set prepared where you've labeled those output values yourself. Um, yeah, so in those kinds of problems, we say that the machine learning algorithm is supervised and is being supervised by your output labels. So those are called supervised learning problems. And um, it could be, they, they mainly have two subcategories. It's either a classification problem where you're trying to classify or categorize your input data into these different classes, like you see red and blue here. Um, or it could be a regression problem where you're trying to predict a continuous or real value number um, instead of an output class label. Like maybe you're trying to predict um, the gradient of red instead of the actual color red. So that, that would be a, a regression problem. Um, so just to give you an example of um, some classification problems, we have um, facial recognition where we're trying to recognize people's faces and um, not just their face, but maybe additional features like their eyes um, or their head pose, you know, things like that. So how does facial recognition usually work? Well, um, convolutional neural networks are a deep learning algorithm that is um, very uh, commonly used for um, image classification tasks. And um, what, what, it, it, what it has is, it is a filter that moves across your image looking for a particular feature. And once it finds it, um, it will give an output of one. If it doesn't find it, it will give an output of zero. Um, another example would be speech recognition, also a supervised learning task where you have um, an input uh, audio sequence and an output text sequence um, annotated by someone, um, you know, for, for speech recognition. Um, so it's, uh, you know, you all have, I, I hope you all have Siri or Google in your phones. Um, and uh, you can use the voice or text to, sorry, yeah, voice to text um, option to convert your voice into some text data like um, it's shown here. Um, so sequence to sequence networks are again, a deep learning algorithm that have so far um, shown promising results for this task. And um, you know, every day new architectures are being released um, to improve their performance because, um, well, we all know this, this, hasn't been, this hasn't really been perfected yet, but um, yeah, th there are people working on perfecting this still. But um, yeah, the, one of the most common algorithms that is used for this are sequence to sequence networks. Um, and finally, I wanted to show you one example of regression, um, which I said um, was like the, the problem of predicting a real number or a continuous value. So an example of that would be the COVID projections that you might have seen all through the pandemic. Um, there were people who, who could project the number of COVID cases we would have in the upcoming months or uh, you know, every other day. Um, so usually you have these time series forecasting algorithms that will take as input, um, let's say the number of COVID cases in the past two months, and then try to predict the number of COVID cases in the next month. And so with every passing month, you're getting that um, data input um, automatically labeled, and then you're using it to predict the next value, right? Um, so. Yeah, this is this is another type of um, supervised learning problem, which um, classifies as regression. Um, here, I just wanted to make a note that um, some of these problems, like um, these sub problems, like um, image classification or text classification, um, they're they're not so broad, um, and they've they've actually been very um, fine tuned, and so you'd find that a lot of model architectures are problem fav favorable. So you find some architectures that favor image classification and then some other architectures that favor text classification. And then you could, you could go into more and more detail in each of those areas. Um, and you'd find that there are certain architectures that are built specifically for each task in each of these areas as well. Um, so it's always a good idea to do some research beforehand, um, but, you know, to find like good model implementations or good data sets for each task um, before you start working on it. Um, the other form of um, machine learning, other than supervised learning, 
is unsupervised learning, where a model's expected outputs, they're not defined, and um, only the input data is available. So um, let's say you have a corpus of, um, you have a, like a huge data set of just text sentences, and um, you're looking to classify it into different topics, but um, you don't really have the capacity or anyone, or even as, a, yeah, just a specific knowledge of how many topics exist, um, you, you just want to cluster all of those values together into some closely related um, categories. So that kind of a problem would be unsupervised learning where you don't have the output label available. Um, and there are certain algorithms that are useful for unsupervised learning as well, or, or they're predefined for this task. And one of them would be uh, the k-means algorithm. It's very basic and I really suggest that you um, Google how this algorithm works. Um, yeah, so this is an example of topic modeling where um, someone has tried to um, uh, define uh, uh, conversations regarding Star Wars into um, different categories, like um, this one is here in red, this one in blue, and this one in green. So um, yeah, this would be an example of topic modeling. One thing that I wanted to mention here is that you should really know your problem domain. Um, if you have a task with an output predefined, like um, there's something that you're specifically looking for, uh, just like um, I mentioned in supervised learning, then um, you should always use supervised learning algorithms for that and you should label your data because you know that, that task you're specifically looking for. Um, but if you're unsure about what you're looking for, then you would go into unsupervised learning. Otherwise, mostly you, you would be dealing with the case of um, supervised learning. Um, the fourth point was, um, of course, model training. You know, now you need to practice your information that you've learned. Um, yeah, so this would be the point where you would be teaching your model or where your model will be actually learning. So model training is the process where you feed your input data to your model for learning. Um, there are certain things here that you may want to consider. Um, the first one is the number of folds of your data. So you want, let's say you've labeled a thousand examples, you want some of it to be used for training and then some of it for testing, right? Because um, at the end of it, you want to see how well your model is performing. Um, you need to have that set separated, the one you want to test on. So um, you want to make that decision beforehand, before training your model of um, how you want to split your data into train set and test set. Um, you may also want to decide on the number of times you want to feed your input data or your um, training data to your model. And this is known as revising, or it's actually known as epochs, but um, it's, it's very similar to how humans kind of revise their um, training data or their um, course content before, before taking that final exam, right? So yeah, you, you may want to look into um, this number of epochs thing. Um, finally, you may want to tweak your model parameters if it has any. Um, and um, maybe select a number of uh, possible parameter values, test out each one of them, and then select the best ones that give you the best performance. Um, so an example of a model training is, is this one, where you have these X's coming in as input, which is X is your um, you know, input training data. And these W's are your variables, right? W1, W2, W3. And you can see here that their products are just being added together. So your Y is maybe a, a combination or a summation of the product between your input data and your W variables. So this would be like for every um, input training example, you're learning or deviating your uh, W value just a little bit. So this is how your model would train. Finally, you'd want to sit the model through the examination, right? Your models can't escape, <laughs> they can't escape um, model examinations either. So after training a model, you would want to see those model predictions and compare the values that you've gotten from your model um, with the actual values and um, evaluate overall performance. So um, here we're looking at, um, let's say there are four classification labels. Uh, you want to classify whether an image is of water, of a forest, or it's an urban area, right? And so these are the classified output values and these are the reference values. And here you're comparing um, how many of them it got correct 
and how many of them it got incorrect. And so, you, you, you know, based on just this data, you, I would say that this model is doing pretty well because most of the highest values lie um, across the diagonal. Uh, so just a little bit discussion on the task performance thing. Um, on average, um, most models and um, humans are able to learn almost anything or almost any task following the four steps that I've mentioned before. But um, you might have already seen this um, when you give exams, is that sometimes you learn something um, and you spend really hard um, trying to learn it. But then on the test day, you don't perform very well or eventually your scores, they, they, aren't, aren't, they aren't as good as you, you might have imagined. And then sometimes it also happens that you didn't study at all. Like, <laughs> uh, and um, eventually you just show up on test day and um, write whatever crap comes to your mind. And uh, for some reason, you, you perform really well, right? Um, so just, just how it happens with humans, it can also happen with machines. So you can, yeah, you, you know, on average, you would perform well, but there's also these edge cases of underachieving or overachieving. Um, and these are two that we want to discuss. So um, what can possibly go wrong that leads to underachieving? Well, it could be that the things that you learned in your course are the things that the model saw during training. They were not related to what was asked for during the test. So um, yeah, I think there's a very uh, common meme on this um, that um, you know the teacher teaches um, just some um, normal distance values um, during the course. And then um, in the examination, he asks like, what is the distance between Earth and the sun? Uh, so it's a it's a completely irrelevant um, test test input um, that you're using your model for when the model was trained on simple problems. So um, if you're if you're training your models on um, simpler tasks and you're expecting them to perform well on difficult tasks, um, that won't happen. And that's when you will say, "Oh, my model is underachieving." Um, so what you should do is um, evenly distribute your training and test data so that your test data isn't just full of difficult examples only that the model has never seen before. Um, another reason could be insufficient training data. So uh, sometimes the concepts or the subject is so hard that no matter how hard you study it, it's just, it's just really hard for you to grasp because the book is really difficult or the teacher is, um, is he's not teaching it correctly, right? So in case of machines, maybe the data has insufficient features, right? You're not giving it all of the input values that it needs, or maybe um, the pre-processing of your data wasn't done correctly, right? So what always, um, usually what helps is either you add in more data or you try making new features um, for this problem. Um, the third thing is a model architecture. I can fairly say that um, you know, for Pakistan studies, I, I think I wasn't built to learn um, history in general, but um, specifically for Pakistan studies, I would perform like really bad. So um, I just feel like I wasn't built for that subject maybe. And uh, you know, because that happens with humans, sometimes it also happens with models. Some models just aren't built for solving some problems. And so no matter how much data you feed in, they would, they would just not perform well on it. So um, what usually helps in, in those cases is, you know, you could try tweaking your model or you, you should, you know, you should just try changing your model architecture, uh, you know, to, to get it to perform well. Um, this, the second um, uh, problem of um, performance is overachieving. So, you know, why do certain models overachieve or why do certain iterations of uh, model training give you better results? Um, so one reason could be randomness. Sometimes um, it's just dumb luck, right? The, you know, you, you give totally random answers in your exam and so does the model, um, but it just gets them right for some reason. So um, yeah, the, for, for, for that, you should just um, train your model multiple times and also uh, test it multiple times just to be sure that, you know, it's not just a random output. Um, the second thing could be model pre-training. So um, sometimes we do well on um, certain tests without even studying for them uh, because we've already studied them before 
or we've studied something similar to it before and we we just don't need to revise it anymore right so if i was giving my ielts test i would probably not study for it because i mean i already know english i've given so many i've given like a lot of english exams before so i would probably skip on studying it too much um so that is a case of model pre-training where you could train like a large model on some big task or on a similar task before and then um, just use it uh, directly to predict outputs or maybe train it on some some few examples and then use it to predict outputs and um, you know if it, it might perform well and um, this is actually um, an area of research that is getting a lot of hype these days because there are a lot of tasks that we can train models on and um, get them to perform really well on these other smaller tasks as well. So finally, I wanted to talk about your model predictions um, and um, how you should design them. So in order to trust that your model is working, working correctly, it's a good idea to provide additional explainability with your model outputs, like um, the confidence score and the input features. So um, here I have a snippet from Netflix where you can see that Netflix tells you what features it's used to make that model prediction. So like if you click on a movie, it will show you more like this because it's, it's trying to tell you that I use this, mo this movie name as input feature and these are the output values I got. And then for each of those output values, it also shows you like the percentage or the confidence that the Netflix model has for each of those outputs. And um, sometimes it's useful because um, you're you're trying to predict how well your model is doing, um, you know, for for each output value. So you know you should definitely consider this um, in your AI or machine learning model design. So now that we've studied all of this, um, let's quickly train a model um, at this URL. So I'm going to speak, you know, just speak out this URL for you. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's called Teachable Machine dot with google dot com. I'm, I'm going to train it with you so you can either watch me or you can go to this URL and try training a model yourself. So if you um, if you go to teachable machine dot with google dot com, um, you would see this get started option. Um, basically, this website was built um, for for training models really quickly. So what you can do is um, create any model. Um, you know, first create any training data set and then click on train model. And then you can export that model into your website, into your mobile app or um, any other use case you really have. So um, let's click on get started. Okay, so here it's, it's showing me um, the type of input data that I can select. So I can either start an image project and um, yeah, just classify images or I can start an audio project and you can see that here in audios, it's showing you the audio features. These are spectrograms that are created directly from your audio input. So um, that's nice. And then third is pose project, where you may want to predict like the pose of a human. Um, so I'm gonna start with image project because I like images. <laughs> um, so first you get to name the classes that you want to predict. So um, let's say my first class is Ramcha, which is myself. And then the second class is uh, Panda, which is my, my Panda pillow. Um, so I'm just gonna turn on my webcam and um, collect um, as much as, um, you know, images of myself as I can. So I'm gonna click on record and just gonna select like a lot of examples of myself. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so it, I think it's 100 images. So that's, that's really good, right? Um, and now I can select um, images for my panda pillow. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna hold record and just let it let it select my panda. Oh, so there's 130 samples. So um, yeah, these are comparable um, number of um, samples. You always want to have like a lot more examples, and you know, what what if this model can't can't tell? that it's me if I wear a different dress. So yeah, you can always add in more examples here or in your own implementation and um, that, yeah, it will just make your model um, better at predicting something. Now I'm going to click on train model and 
um, I'm going to click on advanced after it's done preparing the training data. Hmm. I think the number of examples are so much that, ah, oh. oh, okay, no, it's training. Oh, yes, so you can click on um, under the hood and what it should show you is the accuracy and loss per epoch. So if you see the orange line here, that is your test performance. And then the blue line here is for your training data performance, right? And so here it's showing you two values. The loss is um, how many values is getting wrong and accuracy is how many is getting right, right? Um, and then you can, you can also configure like other metrics like the confusion matrix or the accuracy per class, right? Um, this, this under the hood is just to it's just to figure out like um, if if you just want to see how well your model is training, you can click on under the hood, and then you can also adjust some of these training parameters based on you know your your choice really, or how well your model is working. And so now you can see the model predictions in real time. So right now it's saying that this is Ramsha, and then if I bring my panda, it's a panda, yay! <laughs> so. I really like this. Um, after that, after you, you've built your model, what you can do is export it. If you click on export model, you will see that there is um, actual code available in JavaScript, in TensorFlow, um, and in Python, actually. Yeah, TensorFlow, Keras Python, and then also in TensorFlow Lite. So this is for Android or your Coral app. So um, I work in TensorFlow Keras, and um, I would definitely suggest that if you're starting out um, in machine learning or, um, yeah, the machine learning or data science, I would definitely recommend that you choose the Python programming um, language and then um, try out the TensorFlow Keras API. And uh, yeah, you can you can just copy paste this code into your Colab notebook and uh, it, sh it should hopefully um, build the same model um, as we've built here. So I'm gonna click on cross. Oh, and just uh, just uh, uh, for people who are, that are concerned with privacy, um, this is um, all of this data is stored on your drive and not going to Google. So you you don't need to worry about that. That's mentioned in their privacy and protection. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it as far as my presentation goes. Um, I thank you for joining in, and um, if you want to reach me, you can reach me at this email ramsha at gdglahar.com. You can also send me a connection request on LinkedIn um, and then I will hopefully accept it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so are you able to hear me, Ramsha, now? Yes, and I can, I can actually see um, the comments as well. Okay, uh, okay, so let's go over the comments. So if you are able to see the comments, maybe you can just read out the questions out yeah. loud and then answer them. Uh, okay, so the first question is from Jason Kung. Hi, nice to meet you today. Nice to meet you too. I would like to ask what kind of methods are available to do multi-class or multi-label classification? Currently, I'm detecting defects on steel surfaces. Ah, uh, for a multi-class classification, if you're asking on Teachable, um, there was actually an option to uh, add in um, a new class right next to uh, like the, the classes that they've already given. So if you go to the here, you can see the add class option and you can add um, as many classes as you want. I don't think they're allowing multi-label classification because, well, I could only see like one class predicting here. But um, yeah, so you can do multi-class classification, but I think you'd have to send them a message or ask them for this new feature. Because uh, yeah, definitely, I, I really like multi-label classification too, so I don't know why it's not available here. Um, what's the best online resource for AI or ML? Uh, it's by Mehreen Masood. Hi, Mar hi Mehreen. Um, for um, AI or ML, I, if you're starting out, I would definitely suggest that you go to Coursera. Um, Coursera has a lot of courses on like introduction to artificial intelligence, introduction to machine learning, 
Um, these courses are from deeplearning.ai, are from um, TensorFlow. And um, yes, and take any of these courses and they should work fine for you. Um, and I think then, I would uh, just like to add on to that. So edX has also pretty good courses and even Udacity. So I think if you are looking for introduction courses, Udacity, I personally love Udacity, even their platform, how they have designed it in terms of interactivity and even in terms of content as well. So, you know, people who work at Google, they create courses mm -hmm. themselves. So yeah. the tips you get from there, you, you you will be actually able to use those in your even your interviews as well. So people who are just starting out, introductory courses are free there. Otherwise, obviously, you will have to uh, pay for the subscription. But of course, then there are other options of applying for financial aid as well. So do check those out as well. So, but I'm sure you're going to with the other questions. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to also mention that my first um, ML course was by, by Google developers and it's it's the TensorFlow crash course. It was released by TensorFlow. It is freely available um, and it's on the developers.google.com website. Um, yeah, they have their own uh, TensorFlow uh, collab notebooks and then um, actual free lectures over there. So, and, and they're very detailed. So I started off from yeah, that. And I think uh, another thing, so, all the lectures by even Stanford and MIT, they are recorded. Mm -hmm. So like, even yeah. if you YouTube those yeah. sessions, you will find, like I've been recently following one uh, one uh, class on deep learning. So like I've already gone through it, but the sessions are so interactive and you know, they're like, you always get to learn something new. So even yeah. if you YouTube and even if you go to the websites, professors have like they have the material out there they upload the videos every week they they even have those assignments the only thing you're not able to do is maybe just submit those assignments and you know you're not graded on them because obviously you're not a student but in terms yeah. of content it's available on youtube and all the professors by mit stanford harvard mm -hmm. all those uh, lectures are available on youtube so people who actually want to go into the depth of the topic uh, mm -hmm. If you want to, you know, maybe look at the field of NLP or maybe computer vision or something else, uh, even data science in general, you will find those lectures on YouTube. So make sure that you actually go to YouTube and, you know, just search out the topic and maybe write MIT, Harvard or something. You'll find, you'll definitely find uh, some relevant lecture over there. Yeah, yeah, you, you totally can. Um, then there's uh, Gajan Dera Suval. I'm so sorry if I'm if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, can we use Anaconda platform for this? I mean, Jupyter Notebook. Yes, yes, you, you can. Um, yeah, you can definitely just uh, copy the code. Mm, I should have, I shouldn't have closed it. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you click on export model and um, then TensorFlow, you can just uh, copy this code um, onto Jupyter. And um, another resource that I, I really like is um, Google Colab. So if you go to colab.google.com, um, that those are free notebooks, so you don't even have to install uh, Jupyter or Anaconda. And uh, you can also use their free GPU memory in case you're trying to train like really heavy models. So yeah. Oh, there's actually, there's someone who's already mentioned uh, you can use a uh, Google Colab. Oh, thank you, Seth. Um, then there's Jason. Do you have any useful links for recommendation? Thanks a ton. Um, I can definitely share links after, um, yeah, after the presentation, I will make sure to go to this um, Facebook page and share links for our courses or for learning uh, machine learning. Uh, yeah, right now I don't have access to where these comments are being posted, but uh, yeah, I'll definitely share those. Um, then there's um, Jason again. I'm actually training over efficient net and somehow my accuracy is capped at 75%. Hmm. So, um, oh, okay, so I think this is like an internal discussion where Seth has commented, there's a lot of content on YouTube to search and for accuracy if you want to increase accuracy without hassling around use Microsoft Lobe. Oh, that's very cool. Okay, I think this is a lot of um, their own discussion. I'm just going to skip ahead to Bilal Nadim. Uh, hi, Ramsha. Hi, Bilal. I'm a fresh graduate and have studied machine learning, data mining as my electives but I didn't get job in AI, can you give some tips? Hmm, so I, I think my, my first tip would be, have you um, added in those, um, any of your projects into your resume? Because I actually do um, do interviews for uh, data science hires at ITC, uh, at my company for uh, my own team. 
And uh, what usually puts me off is like if people don't have projects on their GitHub on their resume. Instead, they have like oh the the things that they did with societies in their university. So I would first thing I would say is um, definitely add in more projects um, on your on your resume, and then specifically add in those projects where you've actually contributed or where you know more about the model about the data because those are the questions that the recruiter will ask you. So normally when I go through people's resumes, what I do is just whatever project they've mentioned, I will ask them directly like, okay, how was the data prepared? What features did you use? What was your model architecture? How can you say that this is good performance or bad performance? Did you do any prior research? How would you deploy this model in a real environment? You know, things like that. So yeah, first thing, uh, you know, improve your resume whatever courses you took, um, any projects you did with those, add them to your resume. And then once your resume gets selected, just do really well on improving or sorry, um, explaining your projects. And um, yeah, if you're looking for jobs in Pakistan, I think definitely that would be um, is sufficient. But if you're looking for jobs abroad, um, yeah, they might ask you additional uh, machine learning related questions. Actually, they might ask you those here as well. Yeah, sometimes I ask them, but it, it's usually related to the work that you've done because no one's ex no one expects like um, actual um, like really experienced people coming out of um, universities applying for AI. It's yeah, everyone knows that um, the things that you haven't mentioned in your resume are things that you probably don't know. And so that's fine. People are fine with that. Um, okay, his last comment is that I also study computer vision. And I scored a uh, four GPA in NLP. Please give some tips to secure a job in these fields. Yeah, so um, same, same, same tips as I just gave right now. Um, if you've scored a four GPA in NLP, that's <laughs> that's really cool. I would suggest that you should apply to um, ITC. And um, yeah, if you're in Lahore, we, we, yeah, if your resume is is convincing and you're in Lahore, yeah, I can definitely um, look into that. But um, Otherwise, yeah, just um, work on improving your resume, and um, uh, yeah, you should you should at least um, get an interview with that. I think there's also hirings in Affinity for NLP, right? Yeah. Um, there, there is, uh, there are hirings open for in general data scientist and data mm -hmm. analyst. So yeah, maybe you should apply for that. Yeah. All right, cool. I think that's um, all of the relevant comments. Yeah, and, th and then there's, I think. Uh, yes, yeah, so we're almost done with the questions. Thank you so much, Ramsha, for such an insightful okay. session. I really enjoyed it, and I hope the audience mm -hmm. enjoyed the session as well. And make sure you actually do go to the mentioned website yeah. and try out building a model yourself, because I think in terms of uh, writing the code, there's not uh, much about it. It's just that you need to just press a few buttons, and you'll have a model. So once you have an understanding, people who actually want to code it up, uh, I think it would be great for all of you. It would be a great learning exercise as well. And maybe you can put that on your resumes as well. You know. Yeah. So just one tip I would also like to add uh, for the audience is that when you are mentioning about the projects on your resume, also do mention, you know, uh, so sometimes people just mention that we created a model, right? And it was created for this purpose. They don't mention the steps that were taken before that so let's suppose you face some sort of challenge uh for example if you if you were collecting the data yourself so that's a really big thing right so if you're collecting the data yourself labeling it do mention it because of course um, usually what people do is they find the data from online links and they just use that data sometimes they don't even clean it up because probably the data is already cleaned up and what they do is they just build the, build the model. But I think it would be uh, it would be great and even better if you are cleaning the data yourself and even if you're getting the data yourself, you know, so you can just mention the challenges and how you overcame those challenges. And then uh, obviously just talk about the entire pipeline. So at the end of the day, it's not really important that you were able to build a model, but really important what what the important part is that you were able to go through each of the steps and how you were able to overcome the you know the, the difficulties you faced uh, during those steps and another thing is sometimes people just mention that you know they created a model they don't mention how that model was able to uh, 
provide some sort of value to their company or business goal, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're working in the field of NLP, you you might want to also add that this was your model and this was the metric and how it impacted the business goal of the company. So maybe you were able to increase the revenue of the company or maybe something else. So whatever the business goal is, do mention how your model was impactful because at the end of the day, if your model is giving you an accuracy of 95%, but if it's not really impacting your you know business goal or revenue it the company really doesn't need that model right so make sure you mention uh, those on resumes and uh, then you know interviewers can ask you about those in the interviews as well and you can just uh, mention about how you were able to achieve that but yeah that's about it uh, Ramsha is there anything you would like to add before we end the session uh, no, I, I think um, you've, you've pretty much covered um, uh, all the points that I missed out um, for creating good resumes for machine learning jobs. Okay, sounds good. So thank you once again. And uh, we have more sessions coming up in the field of machine learning and data science. So make sure you all uh, keep checking out the uh, PWIC page. Uh, we have another event coming up towards the end of February. So make sure, you know, just go go to our main PWIC page and you will find the event details there. And thank you, Ramsha, once again for uh, taking out the time and uh, being a part of the learning series. It was really nice having you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Bye. Hey.